I'll call the uh, uh, council regular meeting of July 7th to order and ask all those who would like to join myself and the council and, and the Pledge of Allegiance to please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I have uh, two items of special business uh, this evening, and uh, the first of those is Agenda Bill 6822. And I have a proclamation. Is uh, Sandy here this evening? To receive, uh, okay, uh, all right. So, whereas Larry Kangas has made a significant contribution to the city of Issaquah through the beautiful, historical, and educational murals located throughout the city, and whereas the Kangas Dairy Gold mural depicts the history of dairy farming in the Issaquah area and is located on the premises uh, through fair of our city, Front Street, on the exterior of the building and has been enjoyed by thousands since 1995. And whereas the Kangas uh, Mill Street logging scene mural located on the exterior of the Front Street Market building on Sunset depicts the history of logging in the Issaquah area and has been enjoyed by thousands since 1997. And whereas the two Kangas murals located in the Issaquah Cafe have been enjoyed by customers over the years depicting country living in the Issaquah area, hearkening back to a simpler time and place. And whereas the two Kangas murals located at the Issaquah Salmon Hatchery, the water tank mural and the aquarium backdrop mural have been used to educate school children regarding the life cycle of the salmon and various environmental topics since 1996 and whereas the aquarium mural at the salmon hatchery completed in August of last year was one of the last murals Larry completed before he passed away last November. It is therefore fitting to celebrate his work at this time. And whereas the city of Issaquah will celebrate Larry Kangas on Saturday, July the 19th, 2014, now therefore I, Fred Butler, mayor of the city of Issaquah, do hereby proclaim Saturday, July 19th, 2014, to be Larry Kangas Day. In the city of Issaquah, and I urge all citizens to celebrate Larry and his achievements and dedication to our city. In witness whereof I have hereunto set my hand and seal of the city of Issaquah this seventh day of July, 2014. In addition, I have uh, the honor to declare another special day. And so uh, I would ask uh, Beverly Lee if she would come forward, please. So Beverly, I have a proclamation here, and there are a lot of whereases, just as in the last. <laughs> and if I say something that's not true uh, in here, you let me know. Are you going to read the whole thing? I am going to read the whole thing. Oh, and I would just say, as I look out in the audience, uh, there are a number of uh, uh, folks who have worked with you uh, from the Friends of the Issaquah Salmon Hatchery, the Board of Governors, and uh, other friends here to help celebrate uh, this uh, proclamation with you also to include uh, your husband, uh, uh, Daryl, who just, I think, took a picture. <laughs> so, whereas Beverly Lee has served as the volunteer coordinator for Friends of Issaquah Salmon Hatchery for the past seven years, recruiting and training hundreds of volunteers as docents, salmon harvest staff, gift shop volunteers, 
school science fair volunteers and as ambassadors for the Friends of the Issaquah Salmon Hatchery. And whereas Beverly Lee had prior to her employment as volunteer coordinator developed, devoted five years to the Issaquah Salmon Hatchery and the Friends of the Issaquah Salmon Hatchery as a docent, helping school children and the general public to understand the importance of salmon to our region and the need to preserve the watershed in which they thrive. And whereas Beverly Lee has created a welcoming atmosphere at the Issaquah Salmon Hatchery through her work and volunteers where 10,000 school children learn about salmon each year where visitors and tourists come from all over the world to learn of the keystone role salmons play in our environment and the culture of the Pacific Northwest. And whereas Beverly Lee has supported and celebrated the work of volunteers who provide reliable, enthusiastic support to the Issaquah Salmon Hatchery, without which the function of the hatchery, with only two and a half paid employees, could not be accomplished. And whereas Beverly Lee has been committed to the mission and work of the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and Fish to promote the environment, environmental responsibility principles of the city of Issaquah. Now, therefore, I, Fred Butler, mayor of the city of Issaquah, do hereby proclaim July the 8th, 2014, as Beverly Lee Day in the city of Issaquah and encourage Issaquah area residents to join in celebration of Beverly Lee's retirement from the position of volunteer coordinator for Friends of the Issaquah Salmon Hatchery. Further, I encourage the citizens of Issaquah to visit the Salmon Hatchery to become fish volunteers and to carry on the outstanding work of the organization as demonstrated by Beverly Lee's years of service. In witness whereof I hereunto set my hand and seal of the city of Issaquah the seventh day of July 2014. <laughs> Beverly. Thank you very much. Congratulations. <laughs> and, thank you very much. And I would say thank you very, very much and to all of the volunteers at the uh, uh, Salmon Hatchery, uh, Issaquah Salmon Hatchery, who do such a fantastic job. Okay, it's been my honor, and thank you very much. Uh, moving now to uh, audience uh, comments. Uh, uh, citizen comments are an important part of the public process. We take them seriously and factor them into the decisions uh, we make. Anyone from the public who wishes to comment will have the opportunity to do so. I would ask that uh, when your name is called, uh, you please uh, uh, come to the, uh, the microphone uh, where I just spoke. Uh, state your name, your address, your relationship to the city. Please limit your comments to five minutes. If you have written comments, please submit those to the clerk. And remember to address your comments to the full council and not to individual members. And now I would ask, has anyone signed up to speak this evening? Yes, we do. We have a few people. First, we have Karen Abel and then Erica Sargent. Good evening, council members. It's a pleasure to be with you here tonight. Um, following a great run, or maybe I should say flight, of the Crow Raven exhibitions and five public talks, we are about ready to launch our final summer program. And that is called the Art Outside Art Festival and Highlands Day. It's in partnership with the Issaquah Highlands Council and the Plain Air Painters Association of Washington. Plain air painters simply means painting outdoors. The festival star starts on now Beverly Lee Day, <laughs> July 14th. She won't be so happy with this, with an environmental art project that celebrates the heron who eat a lot of salmon. We'll be weaving giant heron nests 
in the village green of the Issaquah Highlands. At work, Issaquah Highlands Youth, YWCA Family Housing, and the Issaquah School District are all participating as nest builders over four different days. So watch for a story sometime next week, late in the week hopefully, on Evening Magazine as they will be up there on Monday filming the first nest build. The festival continues with landscape painters from around Puget Sound painting in Issaquah and the Issaquah Highlands um, from Friday the 18th through Sunday, July 20th. This group of landscape artists will be also be showing their work in two brand new exhibitions called uh, Northwest Landscapes, Grand and Intimate. That will be showing both at the Art East Art Center and um, up at Blakely Hall in the Issaquah Highlands. The week culminates on um, Saturday the 19th, now Larry Kangas Day, um, and so that's kind of appropriate that we're celebrating art, as well as it culminates on Saturday the 20th with family-friendly art activities, art demonstration exhibitions and par as part of the Grand Ridge Plaza, um, art afternoon, as well as the highly popular annual Issaquah Highlands Day Festival on Sunday afternoon. So we're thrilled to be a key partner with the Isquah Highlands and um, Plain Air Painters Association in launching this summer community art festival. Information can be found on our website, artist.org, the Isquah Highlands Council website, and uh, hopefully this week in the Isquah Press. So thank you for bringing um, this art to us and to your community. And I guess I forgot to mention that I'm Karen Abel. Yeah, I'm the executive director of Art East at 95 Front Street North in downtown Issaquah, 98027. Thank you. My name is Erica Sargent, and I'm here representing the Lake Sammamish Elks Lodge 1843. We're located at 765 Rainier Boulevard North, and I'm here in my capacity as an officer of the lodge. On August 23rd, 2013, we received notice from the Public Works Engineering about the proposed design changes to Rainier Boulevard North. While we welcome the addition of the much needed sidewalk, we were dismayed to, to learn of the proposed seven foot landscape strip in front of our building. This planting strip, which we will apparently be responsible for maintaining, will effectively cut off access to two-thirds of our parking. We asked for a meeting with the design team. On November 5th, 2013, we met with Carrie Ritlin and Tony Nguyen of the Public Works Engineering Department to discuss our concerns. They respectfully listened to our concerns and then proceeded to explain to us uh, that the plans weren't going to change regardless of how we would be impacted. They explained that head-in parking did not fit with the design of our block. They then showed us a complete plan for the entire project. We noted that head-in parking was incorporated into the design of the street in front of the new park on the block just south of us, but not on our block. The only explanation we received was that it wasn't part of the design for our block and the design wouldn't change. We later received a letter on December 5th, 2013 from Sheldon Lynn, PE, Public Works Engineering Director, confirming that, despite our concerns, the design wasn't going to change. At no time during the design phase were we ever consulted about what type of use our building receives. We are a benevolent organization, which means that most of our building use is of a charitable nature. We host a twice a year senior holiday dinner, free to all Issaquah seniors, which gets an average attendance of about 100 people. We host a senior art class on Mondays that has an eight to 12 attendees. We offer a senior fitness class every Friday with about eight to 12 attendees. We host a dinner for the wounded warriors with the expected attendance of about 120. Uh, we open our lodge for memorial services, for meetings of the Children's Orthopedic Guild, for the Leo House Halloween party, and several charity poker tournaments. We also rent our hall to wedding receptions, class reunions, birthday parties, and other organizations' dinners. With each event, our members and guests fill our parking lot and the surrounding street. A large portion of our members and guests are either over 65 and or disabled. We would like to continue serving these communities. When we remodeled the building in 2004, we were told by the city that we could not have a gravel parking lot. It must be paved and have dedicated lighting. 
So your offer of a gravel parking lot is puzzling to us. We were granted our present parking configuration by the city at that time because it was an important part of our building redesign. How is it possible that the city can go back on its agreement with us and we have no recourse? We are a small, not-for-profit organization, and we cannot afford to constantly redesign our space to fit the whims of every new city government. All we are asking is that the city not build the proposed seven-foot planting strip. Failing that, we feel that the city owes us a gravel parking lot, since we did not change the agreement. The city did. We cannot possibly afford the cost of a new parking lot ourselves because the present construction has seriously disrupted our business. We've had to cancel two functional functions already because the public could not access our street. We would like to remain a part of the Issaquah community. Our members are all active in supporting the Food Bank, Compassion House, local Special Olympics, and many other local charities. One minute remaining. Please help us continue serving our community. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone else signed up to speak? Yes, we also have David Wagner and Norb Ziegler. Do you have a copy of that? So, Norb. I'm setting this timer at three minutes. We got five, but you and I have never been able to do anything together in three minutes. We're yourself. gonna do it tonight. All right. Because I got a script. I'm ready. Hang on, I gotta get this computer. Tim showed me how to work it. All right, here we go. My name is Dave Wagoner, and I live at 360 Northwest Dogwood Street, apartment K204 in Issaquah, Washington. And I'm Norb Ziegler from Sammamish, 4617, 225th Avenue, Southeast. The slides you see above our heads are the murals uh, of six, uh, six murals of Larry Kangas's work, which uh, adorn buildings, the hatchery, and is a quad cafe. These murals were painted between 1995 and 2013. The Derrigo mural, which just passed us by, by the way, was painted in 1995 by Larry, who we're honoring on the 19th, and also local artist Evan Jones and uh, Nicole Parsons. The Hatchery mural, which you see up there right now, was painted in 1996 by Larry himself, and you can see a lot younger Larry Kangas. We're now looking at uh, Larry Kangas at the Issaquah Cafe murals, which were painted in uh, 1999, as best we can determine. The Sunset Way mural, which you see in front of you right now, this is painted on the Ale House right by, uh, uh, not even a block from us, depicts the logging, and that mural was painted in uh, 1997. The last mural painted by Larry in Issaquah was the Hatchery Aquarium mural in August of 2013. It was put up on August the 12th, 2013, and it's a day Norb and I will long remember. And that's Larry with his wife Sandy, who will be here for Kangas Day. Where are we time-wise here? I think we're, we're looping around here, Dave. Okay, cool. Uh, ooh, we got 22 seconds, and then we're going to be jerked uh, out of here. So, Larry painted one last mural, or which one was it? He painted a mural in uh, Portland. That was the last one before it death, as far as we could determine. One of the things we'd like to do today is we have some flyers for Larry Kane's Day. We invite you all to join us. Uh, we're going to have doses posted at all of his murals around town between 10 and 2. Give me an extra Okay, second. 10 seconds, because we're right. still under our five minutes. Uh, explaining the historical significance of all of the murals that Larry has painted. So these um, flyers will remind you to join us. Uh, it's going to take place between 10 and 2 on Saturday. 
One last thing I would like to say, uh, Larry passed away uh, in November of 2013. He was our friend. He was a great mural artist. And what I want you to remember as you walk away from here tonight is the fact that he served our country for 20 years as an aviator, Air, United States Air Force navigator on C-130 gunships in Vietnam, which our mayor knows very well, as well as I do, and on Starlifter C-141s that carried cargo and troops between Vietnam and the United States. And as I said, please join us on Saturday between 10 and 2 on the 19th. We'll be there, and we'll have docent stationed around town as well. And most of all, thank you, Mayor Butler and council members for bestowing this honor on our friend, Larry Kangas. Thank you. I don't know how to stop that on either. <laughs> it just goes on. Is uh, there anyone else signed up to speak? Is there anyone else desiring to speak? Please. Good evening, Council. Uh, my name is Danielle Rieger. I live at 430 Northeast Alder, about three blocks from here. And um, I'm a property owner and former landlord, which I will never do again, by the way. But um, so I'm here to talk today. If anyone has ever walked this neighborhood on a regular basis and you've walked across Second Avenue over here, right along Bush Street, maybe you're going to the uh, the concerts in the park or anything else, you might have noticed that people just speed down that hill from the high school. And it's, it's kind of become a problem where um, it's, it's more than a little bit dangerous. And I know a lot of my neighbors have mentioned it over and over, and people have different ideas, but I don't know if anyone has actually brought it to the council's attention, and maybe we could have one of the committees, the appropriate committees or city departments, take a look at the situation and see maybe what a good solution would be. Um, I don't know what that would be. Um, I don't know that the people who live right there would want a stop sign per se, but I mean, I know that there are other options, maybe a roundabout or a flashing light or something. Um, but it is, it is a situation where people just speed down the hill or they speed up it to and from the schools that are there. And um, I don't think it's just high schoolers. Um, I've seen adults do the same thing. And I would say that it's sort of a regular occurrence that um, I would really appreciate if somebody would maybe move something forward and see what we could do about that. And then um, I do have one more other thing that I would like to um, inquire about. Um, under normal circumstances, I would probably look into it a little bit more on my own before coming to you, but as I'm standing here already. Um, I was curious, um, as a, a downtown resident, because our neighborhood is zoned single family and duplex, but they just built, um, just on Andrew Street, two blocks east of here, a, um, well not a, they just built on a double lot, four three-story houses on a double lot, which seems to be more than what the standard lot rules would allow, but I haven't actually looked into it. So if somebody could maybe direct me to what provisions in our local zoning would allow for that or what exceptions were given for that, I'd really be curious um, so that if anyone wants to do that on my block, maybe we would have some sort of say about it you know, before it happened because it's built three stories tall in a neighborhood where everything else is one story, one and a half. Um, and it sort of sticks out a little bit, not to mention that there's you know, four packed in there. Um, so if, you, if you've anyone could direct me to, to how to figure out what's going on there and um, if we can change it at all, that would be fabulous. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And you may be in luck this evening because Commander Stan Conrad, who's sitting next, he, uh, he copied down the information. And so I think it ended up in the right department this evening. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience desiring to speak this evening? Anyone else desiring to speak? Yes, ma'am.
Good evening. My name is Suzanne Suter, and my address is 133 140th Place Northeast. And um, there are four things I'd like to comment about this evening. One particularly is how beautiful the baskets are on Front Street. I was really taken this afternoon with, I think they're the most gorgeous they've ever been. And so I commend all of the citizens who've supported that program. Um, the next thing, and I'm sorry, I obviously missed a very important part of this evening, uh, but I would like to share with you the joy I have with um, playing a small role in the beginning of the, the uh, murals in, in Issaquah. Um, it was 1993 when Jack and Beverly Porter, Bobby Porter's parents, and I decided to go to Shimanis, uh, Vancouver on Vancouver Island on the east coast of Vancouver Island and visit Shimanis, which is a charming community that has reinvented itself with the mural program that they developed. Um, and uh, we spent three days up there visiting with all of the people who were the movers and shakers of making that happen in the wake of their mill being closed and uh, the jobs being lost and wanting to create something that would draw people to their community, which has been very successful. People have come from all around the world to um, enjoy the many festivals, I mean many um, murals that they have up there. So that was kind of the inspiration to come down to Issaquah and talk to the city about possibly um, putting together a policy and procedure if we were to want to have murals in Issaquah. And so uh, that took place and then the decision to find possible um, mural spots, which of course Derry Gold was the obvious, and putting together the, uh, the photos of the previous um, farms and dairying in Issaquah and so the rest is history. But what a joy it was to meet and uh, bas basically invite Larry Kangas to come to our community and what an incredible um, effort he has put in to making our community memorable. Today I was uh, interviewed by Tim upstairs when I came back down through the city, there were a group of people looking at the logging mural with their children and pointing it. It was very gratifying to see that happen. And um, Larry was a marvelous young man who I feel was just the perfect person to come to Issaquah and leave his mark not only at the dairying but also at the hatchery, at also the logging, at the Issaquah Cafe, the creamery up in Fall City. So um, it is mixed with mixed emotions that he's not here this evening, but I just wanted to share that what a joy it's been for me to know him and to see what, what has been accomplished. And then on another note, we have, I know that there's been another celebration this evening for our dear Be Beverly, who has also made a tremendous impact on our community with her uh, leadership with FISH and teaching so many docents to share the the story of the miracle of the returning salmon. So with heartbreaking knowing that she's no longer going to be doing that job, but what a perfect night this is to acknowledge two great people for our community. Thank you. This book about Shimanis is, is a marvelous inspiration that I treasure. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience uh, desiring to speak this evening? Anyone else desiring to speak? Third and final call, anyone else desiring to speak? Seeing no one then, audience comments are closed. Before we move to committee and regional reports, I would point out that uh, Council Member Mary Lou Pauley is excused this evening. And uh, I would move to uh, Council Member Milligan for uh, uh, committee or regional reports. Uh, I have none tonight, thank you, Mayor. Council Member Martz. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Council Land and Shore Committee will meet uh, tomorrow night here in Council Chambers. We have three things on the agenda, uh, a discussion of a cost code development agreement, and then the public lands inventory that was an earlier council goal, and then a DSD update from Charlie Bush, our DSD director. 
And then secondly, I want to mention that um, the SCA Public Issues Committee uh, will be meeting then on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock uh, in, in a different location than normal. We'll be meeting in Kirkland City Hall. And there are a number of uh, items uh, on the agenda as potential action items. The council has received the packet. Uh, the one that I would like to draw people's attention to is the King Conservation District Program of Work. Uh, this was a request, uh, basically, uh, there is a potential tax increase associated with the King Conservation District. Uh, the PIC asked for a budget breakdown and uh, received that information. Some of it was fairly late breaking, so I won't expect everyone to already be on top of that material uh, as it came in just this afternoon. But if you could get back to me before Wednesday afternoon with your thoughts, if you see anything that you believe warrants uh, further attention, uh, or uh, if you think uh, a position is, is called on it, I think there's generally uh, enthusiastic support out of the pick for the KCD. Uh, but, you know, we, uh, we want to look at this carefully and make sure that taxpayer money is being used well, so I would appreciate any feedback that you might have. That concludes my report. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Scher. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening to members of the viewing public. The Council Infrastructure Committee will next meet on Thursday, July 17th at 5.30 p.m. in the Pickering Room of City Hall Northwest. The agenda has not yet been scheduled, but upon approval of tonight's consent calendar, uh, we will be taking up the issue of potential amendments to our city's food packaging ordinance. Uh, further updates will be available on the city website as the meeting date draws closer. That concludes my report. Thank you. Council Member Barber. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Eastside Fire and Rescue's Board of Directors meeting has been canceled for this month. And services and safety has been canceled for this month, so I have no report. <laughs> <laughs> Council Member Goodman. No report. And Council President Winterstein. No report. Uh, with that, then for the mayor's report uh, this evening, uh, there will not be an executive session meeting this evening. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about our police department, consider applying for our Citizens Police Academy. Starting in September, our police department will hold a free academy for adults 21 and older who live or work in Issaquah. The application deadline is August the 15th. For more information, please visit our website at issaquahwa.gov backslash police. As of July 1st, single-use plastic bags are no longer allowed at most Issaquah retailers. In an effort to help protect the environment, Issaquah voters upheld the ban this past February. The city is helping to support the measure by providing reusable bags to the community. You can pick up your free reusable bag while supplies last at the Issaquah Cleanscape store located at 317 Northwest Gilman Boulevard in Gilman Village. To learn more, go to issaquahwa.gov backslash bags. Many exciting arts and culture events are happening in, in Issaquah this summer. The Seattle Shakespeare Company presents free outdoor productions on the Issaquah Community Center Green. Join us this Thursday, July 10th, for a performance of Julius Caesar. The show begins at 7 p.m. Bring a picnic and enjoy the free performance. Issaquah Art Walk continues this Friday, July the 11th, starting at 6 p.m. This free event is presented by the Downtown Issaquah Association. Visitors can watch artists in action, participate in creative activities, and listen to live music. And Concerts on the Green returns tomorrow evening, Tuesday, July the 8th, this free, family-friendly event takes place every Tuesday evening in July and uh, August at 6 p.m. on the Issaquah Community Center Green. Concerts will continue through August the 26th. For more information about our concerts and all the events that I just discussed, please visit our website at issaquahwa.gov. And that concludes the Mayor's report. Uh, moving now to the consent calendar, I'd ask if the accounts payable and payroll uh, have been reviewed. 
Yes, they have. Yes, I have. Thank you. And what is your pleasure on the consent calendar? Council Member Winterstein. I move that we approve the consent calendar as submitted. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the consent calendar as submitted, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, that motion carries unanimously. Moving now to item number eight, regular business. Uh, uh, agenda bill 6774, use slash consumption of marijuana in public and DUI. Uh, this agenda bill is coming back to the council from the Services and Safety Committee, uh, uh, Council Member Barber. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this evening before us is 6774, and this is um, uh, Initiative 502 that was passed by the voters, uh, which prohibits the use and or consumption of marijuana in view of the general public. This was codified under the RCWs um, and carries a penalty of $50 per statutory assessment. However, this provi provision has not been adopted by the city of Issaquah, and subsequently our municipal court does not have jurisdiction over such civil infractions under the RCW. Amendments to the Issaquah Municipal Code, Title IX, Criminal Code, would include an appropriate reference to this RCW. Uh, it would also ensure that Chapter 9.07, Issaquah Municipal Code, substance, paraphernalia, toxic fumes, and poisons is consistent with the RCW. So there's a couple parts of this. The next piece would be um, under 502, there was set a five um, nanogram of active THC per milliliter of whole blood. Uh, any concentration at or above this threshold is consistent, um, considered a DUI. Amendments to the chapter 10.05 Issaquah traffic ordinance would adopt a relevant section of state law pertaining to this new DUI standard. And the next piece is um, for the alcohol, um, state law contains a so-called open container law which prohibits having an open container of alcohol in a passenger compartment of a vehicle. This law is specific to alcohol and not directly applicable to recreational marijuana. To address this, a new section is proposed to be added to the Issaquah Municipal Code Title 10, the Issaquah Traffic Ordinance, which would make it illegal to have an open container of marijuana in a passenger compartment of a vehicle. This fine uh, for violating this section would be $250. So to um, Commander Conrad is with us this evening to help answer some of our questions and to walk this through a little bit more. But to start this evening's um, discussion, I will move to adopt Ordinance 2717, amending sections 9.07.010 and 10.05.515 of the Issaquah Municipal Code and adding a new section, 10.05.030 to the Issaquah Municipal Code to adopt a misdemeanor penalty provision as established by RCW 69.50.425 for violations of the enacted city code provisions which are consistent with chapter 6.69 Point five zero RCW. Second. It's uh, moved and seconded. Uh, questions or discussion? Council Member Scher. Uh, thank you. Um, so there were a few technical details that I had some questions about, and I don't know if Commander Conrad or Council Member Barber can, can address them. Um, there were three areas that I had some technical questions about. One was on the penalty. Uh, it was just mentioned that the penalty for the open container in a vehicle would be $250. Um, I couldn't find that in the proposed section, the 10.05.030. It didn't prescribe the penalty, and it seemed somewhat inconsistent with the RCW dealing with open container in view to the public which is RCW 
which is a class three infraction and therefore has a $50 penalty. Colorado is it, uh, $50 does, for open container in a car, so I didn't know why I was, was inconsistent. It does state up to $250, and I'm not sure exactly how the court establishes the penalties, but for instance, the um, public view would be it's $50, and then there's an additional assessment that the court said would bring the fine up to $103. So I'm not sure if that's the explanation. You know, maybe Wayne knows a little more about how that $250 um, penalty is assessed on that particular uh, level of infraction. But again, it's up to $250, so it's whatever is established by the city and the court. So that would mean that IMC 105030 would be a class one, whereas the open view to public would be class three, but 105030 doesn't specify the class of infraction in the proposed ordinance. Unless I'm missing something. No, I, I don't think so. And um, I believe then the court would have the authority to set the bail for that, like in other infractions. So it would be up to $250. And so by not being stated, it's just up to 250 because it's not there? Right. Okay. I don't particularly have a problem with it. I, I guess I just point out so everyone understands that is different than 6950-445, which is opening or consuming marijuana in view of general public, the penalty in that RCW says it's a class three infraction, which by statute limits the penalty, the maximum penalty to $50, not including statutory assessment. So it's a little bit different, and maybe we're saying it's different because it's in a vehicle as opposed to walking along the street. Maybe that's the difference there. So as long as we've got a penalty, <laughs> Um, then I guess that takes care of the first issue. Well, yeah, and um, <clears throat> if the state sets a penalty for a certain infraction that we're copying, we can't make it any more than, than that, or, or frankly, I, I think any less. So it has to be the same, whereas this uh, open container in a vehicle, I guess, is a different situation. Okay. So then the second issue relates to the open container law, in terms of whether this is moving or non-moving. And it didn't specify, the, the first part of the 1005-030 seemed to suggest that it was, it could be a moving violation if you're driving upon a highway, it doesn't really say driving, but then C talks about the registered owner not being present in the vehicle, and so then in theory you could be parked on the side of the road. And there is an RCW dealing with uh, I'm sorry, it's a whack dealing with open container infractions being put on the driving record, and it talks about an infraction for an alcohol open container not being put on someone's driving record if the person was a passenger in the vehicle at the time the notice of infraction is issued. Well, that doesn't apply because this isn't alcohol related. So would it then be a non-moving violation by default because it's not specified as a moving violation? Honestly, I'm I'm not sure at this point. I don't know if that would classify as a moving violation or not. We could try to find that out and get back to you. Okay. It's okay. So it's a little unclear. Um, I mean, it's not going to cause me to vote against it or anything. It's just some technical issues that I think might we might want to take a look at for the court's sake for clarity purposes. And then the the third issue I had was there's a number of sections being cross referenced in part. Two, section two, Issaquah traffic ordinance, statutes adopted by reference. And it refers to various RCWs in 4609, 4616A, and I'll use that one as an example. When I go to 4616A405, which is to be cross-referenced, it talks about campers, mopeds, and wheelchairs. And it says that they are considered vehicles for the purposes of registration and license plate display. Nothing about marijuana, nothing about open containers. So I was a little bit confused on the, it's fine if we want to adopt by cross-reference various RCWs, but I didn't see how it related to the purpose of the agenda bill. Oh, uh, that's already in the code and the change, it, this wasn't done in legislative style, which it, you know, would have been clear. So that doesn't, that's already there and it doesn't change. The marijuana parts were uh, added, uh, must be some of these others. Oh. Ah, there is a legislative, I'm, I'm advised. And so um, 
page uh, 88. You can see that K, subsection K, is really the, the, um, the substantive addition of the cross-references to the RCWs. And those are the, the um, marijuana-related uh, RCWs. So that's the... Um... I recognize some of those as the DUI RCWs. The DUI and then the driving while uh, under the influence of marijuana. What are we calling that? Uh, driving while dope. Oh, right. I think it, just dope, that. Dope driving under the influence of okay. marijuana. Or I was just confused about the references to 4609 and 4616A, which dealt with off-road vehicles, campers, mopeds, and wheelchairs. It didn't seemingly fit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got, I got all the other stuff, the 4620 and, and the 4661. So... I don't know if you have an answer for that. I, I'm sure it's fine adopting by reference various RCWs, but those didn't seem to have anything to do with marijuana. You know, I'm, I'm talked to Jason a little bit about this, about what he was doing. The only thing he explained to me was there was some um, housekeeping to kind of catch up with some of the changes in the RCWs that we hadn't done, and they were all within the same chapter. So he wanted to get them adopted at this point. <laughs> okay, that, that's fine. I, I'm, I'm supporting the bill. I just... For, for the court's sake, I, I wanted to make sure there was some clarity perhaps that could be conveyed to the bench on, on these issues. Right. It doesn't, the, the, the moped uh, thing, camper moped and wheelchair, doesn't have anything to do with marijuana. It is just an update of a previous section that had been recodified or placed in a different section. And so Jason is just updating the cross-reference. Okay. That confused me quite a bit. But I, hopefully you can... Just make sure that the penalty issue and the non-moving issues are adequately resolved. I mean, I don't think it affects the viability of the bill or what we're trying to do through this, but those seem like there's a bit of lack of clarity that might be, I, I don't know, if it, if it were me, I wouldn't understand what the impact of the ordinance was if I were determining an outcome of this violation. So it's just confusing. And my understanding is part of it's like um, Wayne was explaining, was identified and clarified in the RCW, but the open container one is specific to Issaquah if it's adopted. So the RCW didn't establish anything, so we just tried to make it similar to that. Right. So I would just say on, on that one in particular, the non-moving and the penalty would be areas to, to explore uh, some further inquiry on. But again, it doesn't change my view on the bill as a whole. Just a little bit of, of fuzziness on those questions. Thank you. Council Member uh, Winterstein. Um, uh, thank you. Um, thanks for the detailed um, analysis, uh, Josh. I will add that when this was in committee and we were looking at this, I was interpreting the um, phrase of upon a highway as just being on the road, uh, moving or not. That was my interpretation in committee. So, um, and so I, I don't know if we discussed that in particular and that we, we talked quite a bit about what was a highway, but, um, uh, but, um, as it really, and so, and a highway is really any public street. It could be your cul-de-sac. Uh, it could be, you know, high, you know, um, Newport way. It doesn't matter. So, but, uh, but it was my personal, uh, interpretation when we were, um, reviewing this, that it meant um, it was in a vehicle, and, and and then whether you were moving or not. So, um, I'd say what it's worth. That's that was my because yeah. because one of the things we discussed is how it was we're uh, lining this up uh, with the current law regarding uh, open containers of alcohol. And what I liked about the way this was drafted is that if you understood that law, then you understand this law. There's no ambiguity. Uh, an open container cannot be acce accessible to anybody in the uh, compartment of the car. It has to be in the, it can be open, but it has to be in a trunk or in an area that's not accessible. And, and I think that um, um, people who are uh, paying attention understand that. And I like the consistency what we had here. And I know that that also you can't have an open container in a non-moving vehicle, is my understanding. So that was the way I interpreted that, for what it's worth, for my comment. And 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 again, um, I think uh, I was grateful 
you know, I voted in favor initially of, uh, of I-502 uh, for a lot of different reasons. And uh, the idea that, um, uh, you know, I, I tell people this every once in a while, I think the most dangerous thing I ever do is, is operate a vehicle. I think operating a motor vehicle is something that we all choose and put ourselves at risk every time we do. Uh, fortunately, there's not a high accident rate for myself, <laughs> but um, and so anything that protects uh, other users of the roadways and preventing people who are under the influence of uh, even legal substances, I think is a good law. Uh, and I do believe personally that someone who would be under the influence of marijuana uh, is has a compromised ability to um, operate their vehicle safely. So I am definitely in favor of this, and I think we're doing. I think this is, uh, um, you know, the legalization of recreational marijuana was a big step for our state. Uh, this formation of our ordinances to manage it at the state level and, and, with, and within our city level is a work in process. Uh, and I, I think that we are with this action tonight uh, are taking some, I think, some well thought out and, and wise steps to uh, align it with other mo um, ordinances we already have regarding alcohol and, and moving vehicles. Um, I did have some question about the open public view, uh, and there's a bit in there that's <clears throat> still up to interpretation and enforcement, I think, of, of the police department. Um, uh, and so I think I've settled upon that we can't really wordsmith this any further, but um, uh, I th that'll be the one area that'll be what we're watching. I think it's very clear on what's not allowed, but there's some maybe on ambiguity on... Um, uh, of what you know a line of sight might be because you could be on your private property and still be visible from the public and um, And so that would be the one gray area, but as it's written, I'm going to uh, support even that portion of the ordinance Thank you Council member Martz Thank you, mr. Mayor. I just want to thank the IPD um, for their role in this process I was chair of land and shore when we tackled uh, medical marijuana and uh, as chair of land and shore for uh, tackling recreational marijuana um, the IPD has has uh, been very very helpful and uh, in clarifying where the public safety issues are and uh, uh, between the IPD and city staff so quickly coming back and responding to the concerns that were raised as we looked at recreational marijuana with this bill uh, I feel really confident that we've addressed the public safety elements and I'll be enthusiastically supporting this bill thank you Other questions or discussion? Are you ready to act? All those in favor of adopting ordinance number 2717, amending sections 9.07.010 and 10.05.515 of the Issaquah Municipal Code, and adding a new section 10.05.030 to the Issaquah Municipal Code to adopt a misdemeanor penalty provision as established by RCW 69.50.425 for violations of the enacted city code provisions which are consistent with chapter 69.50 RCW signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? That uh, motion carries unanimously. Moving now to our uh, final item on our agenda for the good of the order. Are there any council members that have anything uh, for good of the order this evening? Council member Scher. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just a reminder that the Eastside Transportation Partnership's next meeting will be this Friday, July 11th, from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. We are going to be at the Redmond Marriott Town Center Hotel, in case you didn't get the email. And that will be our um, possibly first ever ETP retreat. And uh, there will be, I believe, both breakfast and lunch provided. Uh, so if you're interested in attending, feel free to let me know, or you can respond to our King County liaison. But it promises to be a, a fun, full day of mission and vision activities. Thank you. I appreciate your enthusiasm. Is there anything else for good of the order? Seeing none, then we are adjourned at 755. <laughs>